Hello, everyone. Welcome again to All Things Food. I'm back this week after a nice long week off taking care of my garden and hanging out at home. Uh, today, we're going to talk about another interesting fruit. Uh, but before we get down to that, um, we're going to talk for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we're going to open it up for questions. So you can ask questions um, either by writing in the chat or raising your hand or um, messaging on Facebook. So um, thank you for joining us again this week. Uh, I picked a fruit this week that is very delicious to some people and really not that delicious for other people. But it's something that I really love and have experience uh, farming and harvesting, um, but, but also using in a lot of different recipes and uh, fruit carvings and things like that. And that is the papaya. So if you've never had this before, it is majorly delicious. Um, one way for you to be able to tell whether or not you're gonna like this fruit is if you like its smell. So I have, uh, you know, I used to eat these almost every day uh, when I lived in a place that they grow, which is the tropics. Uh, these do not grow here um, because they do not tolerate frost at all. Um, but you could grow one if you have a very green thumb and are great at container gardening and have a beautiful south facing sunny window all winter. Um, you could grow these, um, but otherwise you're mainly going to find these growing um, in the tropics. Uh, primarily you can grow them in the US, but they really only grow in Southern California and Southern Florida and maybe the tip southern tip of uh, Texas, uh, because if any of these plants here um, get down to like uh, 29 or 30 degrees, they're very badly damaged. Um, they really like it, it hot um, with very wet feet. They like having uh, well, well drained but moist soil, um, but not too moist because if it's in a boggy area, uh, the tree that grows this fruit, um, if it's soaked for 24 hours, like if there was a flood or something, it could die. So it's kind of tender um, if you're growing it out of its comfort zone. Um, but if you are growing it in its comfort zone, all you have to do is take some seeds and go like that and they'll sprout. It's really when it's in the right place, this thing will absolutely take off. So let me show you what the actual tree looks like because there's something so weird about certain kinds of fruits in the trop in tropical regions that will grow directly off the trunk. So here is a picture looking upwards at a papaya tree. So if you notice, if you're looking up, there's the fruit and it's attached directly to the trunk. Um, this tree doesn't really branch off very often. It primarily grows in one long trunk without bark and the fruit grows directly off of the tree. And then the foliage is absolutely gorgeous. It's the most beautiful foliage. It's like uh, really interesting fractile patterns. It almost looks like a palm tree, but it definitely is not a palm tree. But it grows in the same regions that palm trees would. So um, this fruit is very delicious or to some people, it will be the most, the grossest thing you've ever smelled. I don't know why. Um, it must be something genetic. I don't know if there's any research to that. Uh, there definitely is for things like cilantro. Um, some people think cilantro is the most delicious thing, me included. Um, and then about 10% of the population thinks it tastes like soap or smells like soap. Um, it's sort of like that with this. It'll either smell like totally delicious and tropical, like juicy fruit gum, um, or it will smell like really bad and like, like rotting food. I don't know why. Uh, one of my best friends in the world, she just cannot, like I couldn't even do like fruit carvings with this around her. She, if I knew she was coming to a party at my house, papaya would not be on the menu because just the odor of it, she just couldn't, she couldn't stand it. So this is also a really interesting crop because um, it, uh, if you're allergic, like if you're really, really allergic to latex gloves, you're probably not gonna wanna, you probably won't like even the smell of the papaya, but even if you did like the smell, it might cause you to break out in hives. So um, you can always test that by just tasting a little bit of it or putting a little touch on your skin. And if you break out, then you're not supposed to eat a papaya, but that's very rare. More people are allergic to milk and fish and soybeans than are allergic to papaya. But just something to keep in mind, the latex that comes out of here when you, when you harvest these, because this is the end that attaches to the tree, and to get this down from a really tall tree, it's growing up on the trunk, and there's this little nubbins on the bottom, the, the blossom end, and you take a stick and you push upwards and break the stem, and then you catch it. So you can imagine this one's um, almost six pounds, and uh, catching something like this coming down from a very tall tree takes quite a bit of skill. So um, let me show you this one. 
This is another variety of papaya. This one is called a maridol papaya, M-A-R-I-D-O-L, and it grows primarily in Mexico. Um, and the, and you'll, this is the most common papaya that you'll find in most grocery stores. A solo papaya, a Hawaiian papaya, you're only gonna find that um, in specialty stores like maybe Whole Foods or any of your kind of fancy stores, you'll find them a couple of times a year. But there's many varieties of papayas, it's just these ship really well and they grow really widely in Central America and Mexico where they are native. So um, papayas were uh, during the Colombian exchange when Columbus came from the old world to the new world and started you know, discovering different lands. Um, there was a big exchange of the different kinds of food crops um, between the old world, the new world, and then all of the Pacific islands. And so that's how papaya ended up being very popular in Laos, Thailand, uh, Philippines, um, was because of that exchange. Now, you can cook green papaya. If a papaya is very, very green, if it doesn't have any color on it at all except for green, you don't want to eat that papaya unless you cook it. But once the papaya starts to ripen, you can actually um, grate it up and make something called green papaya salad. Um, you'll see this in Laotian re recipes. Uh, there's Philippine varieties, there's Thai varieties. And if you've ever had a chance to have green papaya salad, it is the most delicious thing. Um, there are lots of places, like if you travel to the tropics and you go to open air markets, there'll always be a lady grating papayas and they have the, this big sort of mortar and pestle vessel that they smash together vegetables, including um, green papaya. And they usually serve it with like a peanut sauce on it. And it's spicy and like flavorful and absolutely delicious. Um, it does not, this has almost no smell. Um, when it really starts to smell is when it gets ripe. So I'm gonna cut this open so you can see what it looks like inside. When a papaya is ripe, it should be pretty soft, but it will also be this beautiful color. They bruise really easily, so make sure that you don't let, if you buy one, make sure you don't let the uh, person bagging your groceries just drop it in there, because it bruises like a banana. So look at the seeds inside of this. Isn't this beautiful? It smells so good. I, I love this stuff. Um, so we've talked before when we were talking about um, different proteases. Um, and this one, the protease, which is uh, an enzyme that cleaves proteins, um, the enzyme in here is called papain. If you've ever purchased um, meat tenderizer, uh, just commercially available meat tenderizer in the in the spice section, if you turn it around and read the ingredients, it will often say that it is papain based or bromelain based or fison based. This is the most popular one. Um, so if you ever wanted to use this as a meat tenderizer, all you would have to do is either grind up the seeds, which is where the commercial tenderizer comes from, or you could blend up the um, the flesh into a smoothie. Uh, I would make a savory smoothie with um, uh, papaya and soy sauce and ginger, maybe a dash of fish sauce if you have that lying around, and then coat the meat in it or vegetables in it for um, a really short amount of time. So if you have something really uh, soft like fish, I would probably only marinate uh, and probably for like a half an hour in, in this. Um, if I had like a really tough cut of pork or, um, or beef, you could marinate up to 12 hours. But if it's like a steak, something that has a muscle of attachment rather than a muscle of locomotion, um, it doesn't have that um, hard protein structure. So this would break it down pretty quickly um, because it is a very powerful protease. Um, in order to keep that from happening, like if you wanted to put papaya in jello. Um, there's a lot of people who like to make jello and put fruit in it. Um, it. You won't want to put raw papaya in it because your jello is made of protein and it will never solidify because the papain in here will break down, will not allow the gel or the gelatin to make a gelatin network. It will break it down and it'll just be like liquid. So if you just cook this really lightly and then stir it in, or you get like canned papaya or papaya pulp, um, that's a really nice thing to put in there because it's already been pasteurized. Um, and that when you cook something, when you raise the temperature of something that has active enzymes in it, 
it cooks the enzymes, also called denaturing enzymes, and then they don't have the mechanical ability to break and cleave proteins um, like they did previously. Um, and you'll see that on if you look on a, a package of gelatin dessert that you're going to make yourself at home, um, you'll read that on the back, do not use raw pineapple. And that's because pineapple also has very similar proteases, only that's called bromelain. So bromelain, Pat pain, um, very useful. You can also make a really delicious, it was really popular in the late 80s and early 90s, papaya seed dressing. It was on everybody's menus um, to go with salads. Uh, it's very delicious. You can buy it commercially made or you can make your own. There's lots of recipes online. So I wanna show you um, how I would make like a really simple, impressive, beautiful, um, like uh, gorgeous, uh, like fruit, uh, presentation with something like this. So what I would do is take a bowl and, and you can do this with all kinds of, you know, things that have, that are, are a nice cone shape um, to do a presentation. So when you remove the seeds from it, don't just scrape because you want this to last. And so you're just going to gently separate the seeds from the inside, just really gently. Um, Cause if you scrape it, uh, the, the fruit will break down a lot faster if you start tearing apart its cells. But if you just really lightly remove the seeds from the inside, it will stay fresher longer. So remove this here. And then this is, doesn't really sit flat. It's gonna do this action right here. So I just cut a little piece off the back And it sits nice and flat like a boat. Now you can like go to the dollar store and get yourself like a little melon baller. They're at every dollar store. And then you can do either chopped fruit in here or you can like take a melon baller and, and make little balls of fruit in here. So it's a way to take something that's relatively inexpensive and make it look super fancy. So that's one of the things that you can do. Now, if you're gonna store the other half, leave the seeds in it. For some reason, um, and you, this is very uh, evident when you buy a, like something like a, an avocado, if you're only gonna use half the avocado, you're gonna use the half that doesn't have the seed in it. And if you store the other half of the avocado, store it with the seed in it and it won't turn brown. But as soon as you remove the seed, the plant just starts to die. So same with this. If you want this to stay fresher and um, last longer in the refrigerator so that you can use it on another couple of days away, go ahead and store it. Just wrap this in plastic and store it in the refrigerator with the seeds and it will last days longer than if you remove the seeds out of it. So just something to keep in mind to kind of lengthen. This is, these are very, they're a little expensive to buy. This one was $1.62 a pound today. Um, they're cheap or almost free if you get them in a place where they grow, of course. Um, but this is kind of considered more gourmet item. I, if you wanted to find any of the Mexican papayas, the marido papayas, um, they're always gonna be just like everything else, always less expensive at a place where, um, like a Latinx grocery store, because this is, that's a Latinx country is Mexico. And this is where, this is what a lot of Central American people and Mexican people eat for desserts and they put in smoothies and things like that. So you're gonna pay a lot less per pound than I did for this one. I had to go to another store for this one. And this one was like $3 a pound because I went to a fancier store and it's considered like specialty. So, but they're pretty much almost the same. So. All right. And then for anybody that was here during the uh, bananas episode a couple of weeks ago, um, we talked about the sap of banana trees. This one also has similar sap. If it gets on your clothes, it never comes off. So um, it's, it's pretty nasty sap. Um, it doesn't hurt you unless you have a latex allergy, but it will ruin your clothes forever. By the time you get one of these in the store, that it's not gonna have any sap attached to it, so you'll be fine. But if you're gonna pick it off of a tree, you have to be careful about it getting on your clothes. Now, some of you may be saying, I'd really like to try to grow one of those. Um, and in fact, you can accidentally grow these very easily during the summer months. Um, I eat a lot of papaya and I have a huge compost pile, um, but I don't hot compost it. I um, 
I don't actively compost. I just let it sit there. I'm a passive composter. And then once a year I go out and I harvest the compost out of it. It breaks down slowly. But if, I, if you don't hot compost, if you passive compost, it doesn't get hot enough to deactivate the seeds. So I'll sift the compost, throw it in there in the spring in my garden, and then I'll have papaya, little miniature papaya trees coming up all over the place. So um, I don't recommend, you, you can grow them from seeds very easily, but the these trees get to 12, 15 feet high and they'll never survive, um, you know, long enough for you to harvest fruit off of them in our ecosystem here in the Piedmont of North Carolina. But if you have a green thumb and you have a warm house and a sunny window, for just a couple of dollars online, you can actually grow dwarf varieties of papayas that only get maybe five or six feet tall. And they start fruiting in about five to six months. Uh, so, you know, once the tree is starting to grow and it's kind of cute because these guys, the tree is a good, you know, 10, 12 feet high when it starts to fruit. Whereas those little dwarf papayas, they can be just a couple of feet tall and be really like rich with fruit. So those would probably be the ones that would be easiest to maintain in your home. So, so that's all about all, all that I wanted to really say about the papaya. If anybody has any questions, please ask. All right, I see some questions coming in here. So the first one is about um, the papaya um, as a medicinal cure. So the person is asking, I've seen papaya in the store as a pill for the stomach. What is that based on? Okay, so that is based on the protease nature of of this. So, um, you know, yes, there's a lot of folk medicine and not to say that it isn't true. It's just that um, it, although it may help some people with digestion, there's not any research to necessarily support that. Mostly this is studied for things like allergies and, you know, different things like that as people would consume them. However, you know, before we had modern medicine, people have been eating these for thousands of years and using them for different things. So um, I would urge you though, that if you were going to take papaya as a supplement, go ahead and eat a papaya because if you're taking it for digestion, it's they're, what they're basing it on primarily is the protease um, activity of the papaya. Once you heat an enzyme like protease, it denatures it. And so if you want to help with breaking apart proteins, go ahead and eat a fresh papaya. Try that first rather than buying it at a pill because all it is is powdered and dried. And a lot of times you don't really know what you're getting. Um, you really have to look into the sources of exactly what you're getting. Um, there's just not a lot of, um, a lot of oversight for supplements in our country. Not to say that the placebo effect is not real. It is placebo effect. There's more research on the placebo effect than there is on a papaya, I'll tell you that much. So if you take something and you swear it works for you, go with it. Is, you know, as long as it's not hurting you and you feel better, do it. That's great. Um, so the next, it's actually two questions about removing of the seeds. Um, so you said that the seeds should be removed gently and that leaving the seeds in is good for keeping the fruit fresh longer. Um, and so the question is, are those two traits um, true of other fruits, for example, like melons? You know, um, that is a really great question, actually. Now, in the case of, uh, you know, like a in the case of a, of a watermelon, they're, they're, they're either there or they're not, and it's very hard to dig them out of there. Um, but just as a general rule, I usually keep the seeds into the side that I store. So um, that's, you know, that's because I'm only feeding two people. But if it's something that we eat a lot of, like a honeydew or something like that, my husband hates this, by the way, so I have to store half of it because I can't eat it, ever. but he likes melons. So a lot of times, you know, this is a whole lot more food than a cantaloupe. This is like two to three times more food than a cantaloupe. So I will usually, you know, just cut up the cantaloupe and we eat it really fast. But, you know, were my husband allergic to musk melons or something, then I would store half of it with the seeds in it because they just last longer. We have a great question here. What will happen if you eat the seeds? You know, I don't know. It may be a little much. I don't know that it would hurt you because there's papaya seed dressing. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know. It's not like they'd sprout in your stomach or anything, but they may pass right through you. Um, you know, that's what happens with birds. They eat the fruit and they eat the seeds and it passes right through them. And when they fly off and drop their little packages, it's like compost. It's like, 
you know, a little pelletized seed almost. It's a seed inside of its own fertilizer and then they sprout in other places. Um, you know, you could make a pie seed dressing out of them. There's nothing wrong with that, but just like eating a bunch of seeds, I don't know. I don't know if it would be very good. And you might get a lot of proteases. So try a teaspoon and see what you think, but I wouldn't just eat all of them because you don't know how your, your body is going to react. And if you've never had a papaya before, eat the flesh first and see what you think before you go eat a bunch of seeds. <laughs> Um, okay, the next question is what mixes well in papaya salad? Um, anything tropical, I love it. Um, you know, pineapple, uh, papaya, banana. This is great to cut up and stick in the freezer so that, because finding frozen papaya is kind of hard to find. You can find frozen papaya pulp in some Latinx grocery stores and, some, and also in some Asian grocery stores, you can find frozen pulp. Um, but primarily, you know, it doesn't freeze and transport well. So sometimes you'll find it in mixes, like you'll find like papaya, banana, pineapple or something, but really strawberries, any kind of acidic fruit is beautiful with this, but this is very soft. So if you're going to serve something in a couple of days, um, I recommend cutting it as close to service as possible because it's, it's pretty soft. Yeah, but oh my gosh, all kinds of great things go with it. You could, yeah, we're talking about melon ballers. You could do all kinds of berries in this. I probably wouldn't do apples. I don't do a lot of apples and fruit salads because they turn color so fast. Um, I would rather cook an apple and serve it um, or eat it fresh out of hand or slices or something like that on a, on a, a cheese tray. Um, but anything that doesn't oxidize is beautiful in here. So you could make this overnight, you know, put your beautiful fruit salad in here. And then right before you serve it, chop up uh, like some, you know, fresh bananas or something and then serve it just like that. So it's very fancy at, a, at a, like a brunch or something like that. I'm ready for my second lunch now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, our next question was about the dwarf papaya that you were describing that we might be able to grow here. So um, could you explain a little bit more about how we might be able to grow a dwarf papaya tree here and how we could get the seeds for such a, a tree? There, you know what, there's all kinds of fruit companies that sell the seeds. And um, I think it's a little bit late in the year to start them because they really like sun all day and they like well-drained soil. So if you got like um, cactus soil or you can even use general potting soil, so long as you like soak it and keep it wet, keep it moist, but that it drains really well. You don't want it to hold on to water. Um, you want something where, you know, it drains all the way out. Um, and a pretty big pot because it's still going to be a pretty stocky plant. Um, the difference with these papayas is the ones that you get commercially, there are um, hermaphrodite seeds so that there's male and female on the same plant. Um, and anything that you buy for a dwarf papaya, the, the, the uh, horticulturalists know that you're going to want that kind of tree. There's other kinds of trees if we live in Florida. We'd be available, we would have so many other varieties available to us and you could grow, you know, the fruit comes on the female trees or the hermaphrodite trees that have both male and female. The male trees, they're just great for pollination. You don't need a ton of those. Like one papaya tree per 15 female papaya trees will give you a ton of papayas. But if, these are very easy to sprout. So even if you buy a papaya and you, you, these are super easy to sprout, but I would go for, you know, you can buy a small tree, they'll send one to your house, or you can buy, uh, you can buy a, um, just the seeds. But I recommend starting, like if you're gonna get a papaya tree, get it in like March, April, when our days are getting longer. And then you can put it outside when it's hot and awful outside. And then you've got a big, beautiful tree that's starting big, big, it can be like four or five feet tall, but it'll eventually start to give you fruit when you're bringing it inside and keeping it warm. The plant will have a much better possibility of thriving if it's already a little bit larger when you have to bring it inside and, and overwinter it. So, and it's a perennial, it's not, it doesn't last for years. It lasts, you know, a couple few years, but it's, a, it's like considered a long, a short living perennial because it's not like an oak tree that's gonna get to be a hundred years old, um, but you can get fruit off of it for a couple few years. I say, give it a whirl, see if you can do it. How oh, cool, very cool. Um, so we have another question that I think is not really related to the papaya, but maybe it is. Um, what if you see ants on your plants? Um, is that a bad sign or a good sign, particularly when it seems like a sweet, um, fruit like this one. Ants on your plants. So it, it, would it be an indoor plant or an outdoor plant? Because ants are usually a good sign um, if they're not fire ants. Um, they're usually not going after 
the fruit a lot of the time. Um, this is susceptible more to fruit flies than it is ants. Um, ants are actually great in the landscape. Uh, they, you know, make underground tunnels, they aerate soil, they break down organic matter. A lot of times they'll eat other pests that will eat your plants, um, except for fire ants. Fire ants, no place for them because they'll attack you. So it's a, it's a different, it's a, they're, they're fascinating. Um, they're the, the class of Hymenoptera, non-flying Hymenoptera. They're amazing, but they're, you know, I, 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 res I respect um, wasps, vespids, hornets, ants, um, but they have this special ability to group together and sting you all at the same time. And fire ants are of that class of Hymenoptera. Whereas like a little black ant or a carpenter ant doesn't want to mess with you. They're after something totally different. Um, but a fire ants, imported fire ants are like a special kind of animal, a super organism. So as long as it's not fire ants, I wouldn't worry too much about it. If you do have broken fruit on a plant somewhere, they may be going after that. So if you clear that away, I wouldn't worry about it too much so long as they're not. Um, sometimes they're leaf mining ants and they're coming and they're like taking apart leaves to go down and, and um, use in their nest. So, but a lot of times they're not attacking your peppers and tomatoes and things like that. So I wouldn't worry about ants too much unless you have an infestation in your house. And at that point, if you're worried about them, you can just puff them with a little diatomaceous earth and they will um, desiccate and, and die. And it won't hurt you to put that on your plants or your food. So it's harmless. So is that word uh, hymenopera? Is that our vocabulary word of the yeah, day? Hymenopera. Oh, my <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have a, oh my gosh. Oh my. And I only have a pencil. Isn't this awful? I'm not. Let me see. Hi. Menoptera. So this includes bees, ants, wasps, vespids, hornets, and they're fascinating. That's great. I, I, was, I wasn't going to let you get away without a vocabulary. Oh, yeah. I, I, I didn't bring my marker. I was so excited about papaya seeds. Oh, what am I thinking? <laughs> um, so we have another question, maybe your last question. It's back to the seeds. Is there any harm in swallowing watermelon seeds? No, not at all. And in fact, it's actually the most nutrient dense part of the plant. And in fact, in Africa, if you go into um, African grocery stores or grocery stores, international grocery stores that have aisles that cater particularly to African populations, um, you can buy them dried in bulk, in bags, and you can cook with them. So they're rich in protein, they're rich in minerals, vitamins and minerals, um, polyunsaturated fats that are good for your heart. So uh, while we have developed, uh, especially here in the U.S., we like seedless things because people have not ever developed a taste for watermelon seeds. But um, in Africa, they actually eat the flesh and collect the seeds and either eat them then or use them for other things or, you know, beat them into like, um, you know, smooth butters or put them into stews. They're actually very nutritious. So go for it. In fact, it's better if you crunch them, you'll get more out of it. If you swallow them whole, they'll pass right through you. So um, chew them up and, and you'll actually get some some good nutrition out of them, but you, should, you can look up recipes of actually how to cook them. I said that's super cool, right? I unmuted myself. Um, I think we have time for one more question. If anyone wants to unmute them, I can unmute you or, uh, or put it in the chat. Anyone else? I have one hand raised. All right, Ms. Yvonne, would you like to speak? Please yes. unmute yourself. There you go. Yes. So with the watermelon seeds, Sherilyn, because I tend to kind of spit them out and I'm a watermelon fanatic. So mm -hmm. you say I can take the watermelon um, seeds and make a smoothie with them? You or... can definitely add them to a smoothie. Definitely you could. But I would probably put them a little bit of them in the bottom of your blender and add just a little bit of liquid and blend them up so that you're really able to break them up well before you add all your other stuff to it. So that would be my recommendation if you're gonna eat them fresh. Um, but they are very nutritious. They're rich in protein, they're great for you. A lot of fiber, um, yeah, they're, they're good for you. You can, you can save them or you can spit them out. There's, there's no um, <laughs> lack, I would say, or shortage of, of uh, watermelon seeds in the world. So yeah, you can definitely use them in a smoothie. Wonderful, I can't wait to try my papaya. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Sorry I was gone last week, but 
we'll keep this thing going and I'll go and hit the produce department and see what's good. And, um, and then we're also, all the chilies are coming in at Briggs. So um, start looking for the chili of the week because it's gonna be spicy, baby. See you next week. <laughs>